I'll go ahead and introduce you. Uh, Dr. David Held, he is a professor and chair of the Entomology and Plant Pathology Department, and uh, he's going to talk to us about management of chili thrips in nursery. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Held. Great, thank you. So yes, we're going to talk about chili thrips today, and I want to acknowledge the people on the side of the screen there. Um, my PhD student, Ariana Littler, um, as well as Dr. Jeremy Pickens, Extension Specialist in Horticulture, uh, who are collaborators on this project with me. So let's jump right in. So chili thrips are uh, one of a couple species of in a genus Skirtothrips in North America. Um, of all the ones that are here, only two of them are pests and only one of those pests occurs in the Southeast. So we pretty easy. If you can um, ID these little buggers down to Skirtothrips, you kind of know that you're dealing with chili thrips, um, that species, especially in the Southeast. The other one's in California. Um, we think they've all come here from, um, the pest species have come here from Asia. So probably India or somewhere over there um, transported here, perhaps on plant material for the accidental introduction. The first record of um, chili thrips in North America was probably a, the first time it was recorded. Doesn't mean the first time it showed up, but first time it was recorded, it was in 91 in Florida. And then it kind of made its way north. Um, we don't know exactly when it made its way into Alabama, but it first started showing up in Department of Ag and Industries pest alerts about 2018, 2019. So we know it's about um, that time when it started arriving and causing problems in Alabama. So we're still under five years with it, with it here. Let's talk about the life cycle. So. Uh, these, the female thrips have a saw-like ovipositor. They do cut the plant material and insert the egg, which causes this little blister. You can kind of see there by the word egg. Now that um, larval stage then hatches out and kind of wiggles out from that little blister in the, in the leaf and begins feeding. Now there are two feeding larval stages, the first and second instar stage. And uh, after that, thrips go through this really interesting sort of um, two pupil stages. So these occur, these can occur kind of on the plant or even in the uh, leaf litter underneath plants. And so they go through this sort of pro or pre pupa stage. And then they have this true pupil stage where at that stage, you can actually see almost fully expanded wings just waiting to complete development um, into the adult stage. Now these two pupil stages do not feed. Um, it's just these two uh, larval instars that are actually feeding stages in addition to um, the adult stage. And so uh, really, if we're talking about damage and feeding on plants, we're talking about either these, these larval stages or the adults. Now that whole development cycle, uh, egg to adult, is roughly about three weeks. So we're in that two to three week window. You can, you can have um, a whole new generation of chili thrips. And depending on temperature, the adults can live quite a long time, like a month and a half almost. And they, they live their longest at cooler temperatures, you know, 55 Fahrenheit would be wonderful uh, on, a, on a summer day, but, uh, but that's more like our spring and, and, and wintertime temperatures. And that's really when they, the adults have their, we call it longevity, their longest lifespan. But egg production is also um, better when it's, when it's a little bit cooler, more temperate around 70 Fahrenheit. They'll produce the most eggs, roughly around 50 eggs per female. And those females are laying uh, on average about two to three eggs a day. So if you can imagine, you've got a, a, a month and a half where the females are laying two to each female is laying two to three eggs a day. You can have a population build up pretty quickly as those then um, hatch out and then start producing their own offspring in a matter of just three weeks. They are really small. They're about half the size of what we think of the other common pest thrips that would be in row crops or other horticultural crops. And you can see chili thrips relative to, to uh, Western flower thrips here. Um, all thrips are, are sap suckers. They poke a little hole and drink the, the plant fluids. And then those cells kind of collapse, which is what causes those symptoms we'll see in just a minute. They're really weak in terms of flight. Uh, most of the time they just sort of jump, throw their wings out that have all this little fringe and, and mostly are just gliding on wind currents. They really are not good at directed flight at all. And so uh, some work in Florida shows that if you're gonna catch them, you're gonna probably catch them downwind where they just sort of jumped and, and glided downwind. And I've already talked about that saw-like ovipositor of the, of the females when they lay their eggs. 
Now, the impacts on the industry are rough. I really like this graphic that um, was out in an Al- Alabama Department of Ag and Industries uh, pest alert a number of years ago, because I think it, it visually summarizes um, how chili thrips uh, took the nursery industry by surprise. And what really is part of the problem here is that they're very small. They're really difficult to detect and they have a wide host range. So this isn't something that's going to be problematic on two or three uh, common species. And you know, you can target those two or three species and just look for look for those problems. It has you know, 100 species of plants, 40 families. Um, and with the popularity of roses and more roses in production, blueberries in production, those are all favored hosts, especially rose. They develop quite fast on rose. But distillium and Indian hawthorn, some of these plants we never even really thought too hard about treating before are now hosts that will probably uh, be attacked and, and may need to be treated during production. They do prefer the new growth and mainly for egg laying. They'll feed up there too, but what their females are doing is just laying all their eggs in that new soft growth. And um, work out of Florida shows in roses as well as some, some other ornamentals, if you're cutting these plants back and fertilizing them, kind of exactly what happens in production, um, you're gonna have much higher levels uh, than versus a plant that has lower fertility levels and is not uh, as heavily pruned and putting on new growth. So this sets up kind of this perfect storm. We are pushing plants uh, for growth and uh, fertilizing them and cutting them back and creating this new tender growth where they can lay more eggs and develop. We do have some good ways to monitor their odd behaviors like flight and other things. And so that's part of what uh, we have ongoing in collaboration with Dr. Pickens and some cooperating nurseries down in the Mobile area. And it's really a sticky card uh, trial that we have going on but their behaviors are kind of interesting. When they're on the plants, they're very fast moving. And if you look at this video, you'll see some of them crawling around. You'll get some perspective, at least on Cliera about their, these Cliera tips about their size and what some of the damage looks like. Um, but they are quite fast as they move around. Their peak activity period when they're really caught the most commonly on sticky cards is this period between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. So when we start getting to the dusk evening, they're, they're really not active and they're really not active in the early morning hours. And so um, that comes into play for a number of things, especially if you were gonna go look for them. And so uh, the other thing we know from their work in strawberries in Florida is that they don't disperse very far. And you kind of think about that, okay, they, they don't fly very well, it's not directed flight. So they did this test in strawberries and after almost two to three weeks, we, they looked at where they put the thrips and most of them were, were right there. So what, what does this mean for, nursery production, that means if thrips are kind of blowing into a block, that block is just going to build up a population. And unless you move them somewhere, they're probably going to be right there. Uh, so they tend to stay in place and not really move around quite a bit, um, at least in the short term, you know, in that uh, two to three week period. <clears throat> now in our sticky card experiments we have going on in Mobile, um, we've got some data to show. We almost have a full year now of, of sticky card data from four collaborating nurseries. And these are the number of thrips on, on cards within a block and outside the block. And so it's very busy, but let me unpack this. These yellow um, columns or bars essentially are showing us when the peaks are. And that's really what I want to direct your attention to. We've got this data on thrips inside and outside the blocks. So we know they're outside of the nursery block as well as inside the nursery block. You can feed on 100 plant species. There's bound to be some weeds or something out there you can feed on. Um, but I want to point out we have a, a peak around the early July of last year. There's a peak in late October, uh, March. And then our largest peak of captures of adults on cards and that's when they could be moving around the nursery again is this time in, in April. So what do we know from the survey so far? These thrips are inside and outside the nursery. So uh, once they get in the nursery, they're gonna stay, uh, we expect them to stay in small blocks or isolated patches and not disperse very far from there. Um, the best thing we can tell you so far would be to look for uh, three as a magic number. So we're talking about months with multiples of three, the three, six, and nine. So that's March, June, and September would be the best time to be out there looking. 
So March, especially, if you saw that the data I just showed you, we start ramping up to a really high peak in April. So that sort of beginning of March is a time if you're going, if you suspect that you have had problems with chili thrips or have experienced it, start looking at susceptible hosts, roses, clear, distillium, Indian hawthorn before. And, um, and, and that is the time to either put out cards or go out and actually look so you don't progress to damage in plants that you can't really sell. And those peaks are roughly about, or those recommendations are about two weeks before we see the peaks. Once you recognize that you have a problem with chili thrips, obviously insecticides are one of the most common ways in which to manage it. These are four of the more common materials that are being used. Um, I think uh, it will, I'll give you some information here on which ones might work better than others based on published tests. But from what I can tell, these are um, four of the more common used with spinosad still being probably the most common one. And I'll tell you why. If we look at the the test data, there's roughly 10 to 15 published experiments that I can find in the literature as there's some of those papers are summarized at the bottom. And if you look at the ones that are going to give us 85, 95% control and about a two to three week residual, we've got a pretty good list. Now, one of the reasons I mentioned that conserver and trust is used is because it actually gives really good knockdown. And I think if we're talking about knocking back populations quickly, you could go out within three to five days after a conserve application, you can get a good knockdown. Um, now, you're not going to get a conserve res res residue that's going to last six weeks or eight weeks. It's not going to happen. And some of these materials are really uh, have some quarks to them. So, for example, aria. If you have a predominantly immature population, those are populations without wings, um, aria is not going to work. It's really, it's really for that movement of adults into a block, you can treat with Aria and, and uh, get pretty decent control. Most of these other products seem to have pretty good efficacy, most of which is against and evaluated against immature stages. Because if you go out and look at these populations and you sample them, they're largely immatures uh, or immature biased populations. Now, if we look at kind of the next tier back, what's okay um, that to, for control? So we're talking about 75 60, 75% control and still getting a two to three week residual. We've got some of the bifenthrin formulations and I just gave an example of one there. Hachi Hachi is another one that fits in this category. And um, Mainspring is a little different. So you actually can get a little bit longer residual based on the literature, like up to 42 days protection against damage with the uh, eight ounce rate of Mainspring. So there is a, a product that gives a little bit less control than something like Conserve or some of the others, but you do get a little more residual out of that product. So another one to, to think about. And then uh, finally, we do have some mycoinsecticides that have been shown in the literature to give in this window of 60 to 75% control. And I've listed two of those uh, trade names there if you're interested in those. Now we also have, uh, we also have the issue of insecticide resistance. Now, I didn't go into this earlier, but there are a number of biotypes within chili thrips. And uh, I think there's roughly like 10 or something biotypes here that we're dealing with. It's a, it's a large number. The one that we find commonly in the Southeast is one called South Asia one. And this biotype, unfortunately, is the most prone to develop insecticide resistance worldwide. Um, so that's a problem for us. In, in what, when we air blast materials across the nursery, we are potentially putting residues not only where we want them, but they could drift out to areas where we are not necessarily conscious. And that's also exposing thrips. So I want to spend some time talking about insecticide resistance. How do we manage this? Well, we manage it by using the IRAC numbers that are on labels. So if you look at any insecticide label you have, you'll be able to look, and I've provided a couple labels here. So if you look at the uh, sort of conserve and trust label, you'll see it belongs to group five, and they're doing this for fungicides and herbicides too. Aria belongs to uh, group uh, 29, and Hachi Hachi belongs to group 21A. So the IRAC code is a, is a number letter combination. Now, the number equals the mode of action. That's what you need to remember. If we're gonna manage resistance, we need to change numbers, not letters. You'll do nothing by changing letters, but you will have an impact by changing those numbers between applications. So let's look at some of the common IRAC codes for materials I've already talked about. So the bifenthrin formulations, they're IRAC code three. The neonicotinoids, the safaris and marathons and others, that's four. Conserve is in its own. Uh, Conservant and trust are five. Avid is six. 
Hachi Hachi 21, um, which mentioned on a previous slide, Mainspring is 28, and Ari is 29. So let's say you go out and, and you are interested in knocking back an adult population with Aria. And you do that and you get, you get good control with that material of the adults. But now you've got an immature population. You didn't catch them before they laid all their eggs. And so now you want to come back with something else. Well, I would suggest you pick something other than uh, uh, an IRAC code six. So you can go with a four, five, or even three. Uh, depending on how much control and residual you want, or even 28 if you want a little bit longer residual. So that's how you would use the IRAC codes in order to manage resistance. And this is an important group to manage resistance. We know they're prone to this worldwide, and so um, it's something we need to be conscious of. So I want to leave this uh, on a positive note. We do are, have a lot of research goals related to chili thrips, and we're going to continue the seasonal uh, pattern monitoring down in these mobile nurseries that are working with us. Then this year, we're, we want to start a um, resistance monitoring uh, program for insecticide resistance. We're going to start off with spinosad, but may expand it to a couple of other materials that we know that they've developed resistance to elsewhere. Then look at this interaction between pruning and timing um, and attraction of those plants to chili thrips, just to kind of re, um, reiterate this idea that we've seen in the literature in Japan, for example. And then uh, we wanna put all these things together and try to develop some IPM strategy for chili thrips management in nurseries that might involve rotation of different uh, insecticide modes of action, in introduction of some natural enemies, some of these myco insecticides, as well as perhaps timing of pruning in order to cut back on the number of sprays, hopefully that we actually have to make for these in nurseries. With that, I'll wrap up and provide my email address for any questions or take any questions that might be here now uh, for those that are in the webinar. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Okay, so is this thing, is the chili thrips, are they isolated mainly towards South Alabama or are you seeing it everywhere? So that's where, that's where um, we've looked primarily. Now, if you go to, um, they actually are moved, they've already established in greenhouses in places like New York. So I don't wanna say that they're only in South Alabama, that's where we worked because that's where the invasion happened and that's where we have a, some issues, but particularly greenhouse operations that could be anywhere in the state could be susceptible for chili thrips. Especially if they're bringing in plants from elsewhere, they look like uh, every other thrips and they're really small if you even see them. So is this something uh, you said they don't really move a lot within the, the nursery. So is this something we're worried about getting into the landscape? that may affect it or you're trying to isolate it into the nursery? So uh, I've been to Florida a couple of times and, and I always look at the Indian hawthorns and see the in the landscape, Indian hawthorns and roses are getting extensively damaged in places like Florida. So the landscape infestations are entirely possible with, with chili thrips as well. Um, I just don't see that kind of pressure here the way I see it in, in Florida. And uh, it could be just because they're just not as widespread here right now. Um, but uh, they do have a lot of landscape damage associated with this, with this species in Florida. And I have one more question. Sure. Um, so the different insecticides that you can use to control, you know, you had some that can somewhat control or it has a, a decent amount. Uh, is there any price and economic value of spraying one versus another and rotating, you know, something that's a little more economical versus something that's like really expensive. So one of the, um, I guess, advantages and disadvantages of being a researcher is I don't have to buy these things. Uh, so I, I can't really answer that question, which is why I gave a list, right? So now, now at least they've got a list and they know what the IRAC codes mean. And so they could go to their distributor with either one of those lists, having an idea about what to expect from those products, and they can start pricing it out for themselves. Um, uh, so I don't have like the, you know, it saves to use this program or that program, but, uh, um, but I, they at least have a list that they could build from uh, whatever their co-op has or their supplier has that, uh, and, and it fits within their budget. Yeah, I was just kind of thinking about 
the the amount of control versus price, you know. So, but all yeah. of them will work. Yes, and we have we have quite a few tests with those materials. And like I said, you know, ten to fifteen. Those those have been tested across roughly ten to fifteen um, published experiments. So we have a good basis on which to. And roughly, I say ten to fifteen. Not all of them were in all of them, but we've got uh, probably at least three or four data points for each one of those insecticides. So, not bad. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing when I was looking at your list. I don't normally think about bifenthrin, you know, in chili thrips. It's an, an oldie but a goodie, and it has a longer residual, and it's considerably less expensive. But do you think that? I mean, I, any insecticides has potential for resistance issues, but um, because conserve or spinosad is known to be resistance issues, do you think we ought to be leaning more towards, I mean, if a grower had to pick, you know, and say switch to bifenthrin or include it in the rotation, you know, you get a little bit less efficacy, you still get a longer residual it look like. Um, well, bifenthrin still is going to give you that two to three weeks, I think, especially in a watered nursery, you know, overhead irrigation. Um, I, I still think you're, I wouldn't expect more or no, nothing like you would see with uh, like mainspring, perhaps. Um, but the um, the ones I'm most concerned about based on the literature actually are the pyrethroids. So bifenthrin and anything that ends in thrin. If you look at the literature from Asia, don't work anymore. Organophosphates. So they actually, um, we probably still have some thrips on labels of some of the old organophosphates that are still labeled for nurseries. I didn't put them up there because we already know that we've selected for resistance in this group, um, the, this SA1 strain that we have here. And so organophosphates, carbamates, and pyrethroids are the three that I would, I, I would use this most sparingly because we already know there was selection potential for those to develop resistance um, and that's why I like some of the more novel chemistries, you know, the Arias and the Avids and, and others, because those are things they really haven't been exposed to um, previously. Uh, Dr. Hill, what do you think about, you know, there's been some uh, interest, at least in the area with uh, flowable nematodes, uh, with redheaded flea beetles, um, all anecdotal, but people, a few people have seemed to, to get some good results from though. And I, I, as I understand, there's some life stages of this thrip, thrips in the, the soil. And is there a possibility there would be some use for some of those products, uh, you know, as a, as a drench or spray? Uh, so I, I don't, life cycle? Yeah, I don't, I don't recall seeing any data specifically for chili thrips, but for Western flower thrips and others, they're, um, that stage, those pupil stages that don't feed, they can a lot of times occur off the plant in leaf litter and other places. There is a precedent that those uh, could be attacked by enemopathogenic nematodes. Um, so, but I, I don't have good data to say that that's, that works well right. with chili thrips um, because it, it's a little messy. The literature is messy about where those pupil stages occur. You can find some where they've actually sampled them and find quite a number in this particular study where they're still on the plant and others where they sample and they're all under the plant in the leaf litter. So I'm not really convinced that, that I know, and I'm, I'm fully convinced that what's, con, what's me mediating this, are they going to pupate on the plant or are they going to pupate in the soil? or in the leaf litter. Um, so that would be the only way reason I would lean away from an enema pathogenic nematode. Now those mycoinsecticides, uh, you know, the tick X and the met 52, those ones that have metarizium in them, um, they, you know, in the, in these studies with roses and they've sprayed them on roses, it was a greenhouse study, you know, they're getting 75% control with just an enema pathogenic fungus. Um, so that, that's, that's pretty impressive to me for a, for a biological. Yeah, that is. And is there, and I, I didn't see these on the list, or maybe I'm just not enough, familiar enough with them, but is there any potential use for IGRs with chili thrips? So um, what was in the list of what IGRs that were tested um, were not as effective. So that's, they would, they would drop below that. They would be 
like a 50% or below, and that's why I didn't put them on a slide, right? I didn't want to, I didn't want to trash a product necessarily, but you know, the one I tried to pick the best ones. There have been some others that are in that IR4 list that have tested some materials that have growth regulator capability, but they just did not perform well. Gotcha. Um, that's not to say that not all IGRs would not perform well, but of the ones that have been evaluated, um, they would be in that 50% or lower um, category of percent control. And that, that mainspring, uh, you put up an eight ounce rate, that's for a spray application. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, if there are no other questions, we can uh, sign off. And I've got yeah. my email there. If somebody um, sees this recording, they can shoot me an email and ask me a question. That would work too. Thank you, Dr. Hell. Appreciate yeah. you giving yeah, me no some problem. time today. Thanks.